Hey everybody, and thanks for joining us today. We're gonna to talk about new security services that exist for container threat detection uh, on AWS. My name is Scott Ward. I'm a principal solutions architect. I work on our external security services team. So this is a, a product team that is building security services that customers use to help them detect and monitor threats uh, in their AWS environments. In today's session, we're gonna focus exclusively on security services or new features within security services that uh, exist to help you with security for container workloads and detecting threats uh, in those container workloads. Containers have continued to grow and are becoming a normal feature of many customers' production workloads. They're using them to modernize existing applications or they are the foundation uh, for brand new applications that customers built. So as we work with customers, one of the, the common questions we get from them are, are how should they be securing uh, their container workloads that are running in AWS and really want to understand what are the best practices for securing those container workloads and running on AWS. And so that's going to be the complete focus uh, of our, of our re remainder of our session today. And so to start off with, the first service uh, feature that I'd like to talk about is the Amazon Guard Duty Kubernetes protection feature. This is an extension of the overall guard duty service. Uh, and it's designed to, to allow customers to get more insight into threats that are taking place against their Kubernetes workloads and specifically the, their EKS clusters that they're running on AWS. So to start off with just a, a quick overview of, of guard duty as a whole, uh, guard duty is, is there to help you uh, identify uh, malicious uh, or uh, anomalous uh, or, or potentially compromised behavior that's happening against your accounts. GuardDuty is a one-click uh, service, one button, one click. You can turn that service on or, or one API call. Uh, it allows you to easily get up and running. GuardDuty takes care of all the heavy lifting of integrating all of the various log sources that it needs to be able to detect threats. You don't have to worry about turning those log sources on. You just start using them. And, and through that integration, Guard Duty is continuously analyzing these log sources and is able to produce uh, threat detection across various spaces, which include Amazon S3, your EC2 instance workloads, uh, your AWS accounts and the users within those accounts. Uh, and then with, uh, with the, uh, the new Kubernetes protection, we can also identify threats uh, against container workloads. Those, are, those uh, threats are identified in a couple of different ways. One is through anomaly detection using machine learning algorithms, uh, as well as uh, threat intelligence that is integrated into the Guard Duty product. And that's based on internal threat research that AWS is doing, as well as threat information from our third party partners in CrowdStrike and Proofpoint. And Guard Duty, once it identifies threats, it's producing detailed findings that you can look at in the Guard Duty console, or you can integrate into you know, Amazon Security Hub, uh, or even just consume through uh, uh, an event-based uh, approach with uh, Amazon EventBridge, uh, which allows you to take action uh, against these findings and, and integrate them into whatever operational workflows you have uh, that when you want to go in and remediate uh, or investigate threats uh, in your environment. So let's talk specifically about the Kubernetes protection feature and what it does. So the Kubernetes uh, feature is focused on control plane uh, activity and is using the Kubernetes audit logs feature. So with every Kubernetes cluster that gets launched, there is a central control plane API that is used to query the configuration uh, of a Kubernetes cluster or manipulate uh, the configuration of that cluster or, or even the objects uh, that exist with, within that cluster. And so you can uh, learn a lot about a cluster, you can control that cluster, and, and even components within a cluster uh, will actually uh, inter interact through this control plane API. So it's a very powerful uh, API. Customers use the kubectuttle CLI to interact with this or, or even just standard REST calls uh, are used to interact with this API. And, and because of the power uh, of this API, it's really important to understand what's happening uh, when uh, with the API calls that are made uh, to make sure that they are legitimate uh, and that you can uh, better understand what's happening with your cluster from an, an operational, a security, uh, and a compliance uh, perspective. And so the audit logs feature of Kubernetes uh, is intended to help give that visibility. And so these provide uh, a uh, time-based 
a view of all the API interactions happening against your Kubernetes cluster, giving you information around what happened, uh, when did it happen, who did it, uh, who initiated it, what were they trying to do, uh, were they successful, um, on which resource did that happen against. I look at this as a uh, cloud trail for Kubernetes. It's, it's giving you that, that control plane visibility around the configuration of your overall cluster. And so we use this uh, as a foundation for being able to do our Kubernetes protection uh, and threat detections uh, within Guard Duty. So what, now that we know what Guard Duty is using and, and, and what that is um, based on with the Kubernetes audit logs, let's talk a little bit about what Guard Duty is detecting and giving you information into. And there's three main buckets that Guard Duty is using uh, the Kubernetes audit logs to create uh, threat detections from. The, the first area is around policy. So this is really around the configuration uh, of your Kubernetes cluster and where you might uh, have exposure uh, with the way that the cluster is configured. So it could be that the your, your, your Kubernetes cluster dashboard is exposed publicly. Uh, it could be that anonymous access is being granted uh, into that cluster. Uh, it could be that uh, there's some default uh, access to, to service accounts at the admin level. Things that would be, uh, you know, configurable through the Kubernetes policy or where somebody's being uh, given a little bit more access than they need. There's also the malicious aspect, access aspect where uh, a actor might be looking to do data discovery, uh, learning more about your cluster, or they might be trying to take data out uh, of your cluster. Uh, and it could be that they're trying to do that through a Tor exit node, uh, a known malicious IP address, or uh, they've got some sort of an anonymous access uh, that's been granted to them and they successfully have, have accessed uh, your Kubernetes cluster. And then there's a suspicious behavior aspect where we're seeing a container all of a sudden launched with privileged uh, permissions that, that is not normally observed, or there is a Kubernetes pod that is starting to execute system commands uh, that are uh, not normal. Uh, for a Kubernetes cluster or could be suspicious commands. So we're, we're trying to give you visibility around these three main areas. And we're continuously analyzing your Kubernetes audit logs in order to be able to accomplish this. And so as you use the EKS service, GuardDuty will automatically consume all those audit logs into the, the GuardDuty system. If you're using one cluster, a hundred clusters, it doesn't matter, GuardDuty will automatically consume that. You don't need to turn on the audit logs feature of uh, EKS in order to make this uh, integration happen. However, if you do want to have the audit log information yourself, you would need to turn that on and set uh, a storage location. So Guard Duty is continuously analyzing uh, all of this data coming out of your EKS clusters. And then at the end, it's generating findings uh, using the, the, the MITRE ATT&CK framework uh, as a guideline. So you can see the, uh, the different finding types that Guard Duty creates based on EKS audit logs. Down here at the bottom, things around uh, trying to get escalated, priv esca escalated privileges, uh, trying to do discovery that they uh, have access to credentials, uh, or they're trying to get more of a persistent foothold uh, inside of your cluster. So a lot of information that Guard Duty can uh, give you uh, and help you understand around what's going on uh, with threats uh, against your, your EKS clusters. Now I'm going to walk into a little bit more insight into what you get when you look at, uh, at a Guard Duty Kubernetes finding. And this is, uh, I've taken a couple of screens here to break down one overall finding to, to highlight some key details here. And so this first screen is, is the overall detail around the actual finding type. So in this case, we could see that uh, somebody has actually gotten successful anonymous access uh, into uh, an EKS cluster. I'm going to get an initial overview around when was this first observed which of my, my Kubernetes clusters this actually is for and which region and in, in which account uh, this was, uh, was is located in, as well as a, a quick overview uh, of the particular uh, threat that was observed. Digging a little bit deeper into the finding, I'm going to get more information about the actual resource that was impacted. So I'm going to get more details about the actual cluster, uh, the unique identifier, which uh, you see I have it uh, uh, deployed into uh, the specific workload uh, that was impacted and, and the specific uh, Kubernetes user uh, that was associated with this particular finding. 
And then I'm going to get more detail about the actual action that was observed. So in this case, it's, it's a Kubernetes API call. So I'm going to get some more information around the actual uh, uh, parameters that were made in that API call, uh, the status uh, and the uh, you know the action they were taking. In this case, it was a create uh, of creating an actual cron job uh, in my Kubernetes cluster. So a lot of detail to help you really truly understand what was that threat and, and what were they trying to do or what did they do uh, in order to raise uh, that particular threat uh, that resulted in a guard duty finding. So after a threat's been observed, you ultimately want to go in and remediate it. And with the guard duty Kubernetes protection feature, we are providing uh, multiple areas of guidance around what each particular guard duty uh, finding type means and how you can go about and remediate those. And so we are public, we've published a couple of different documents. This first one here are is part of the guard duty public documentation. And so every finding type that guard duty raises for Kubernetes protection will have an entry uh, in this guide that highlights what that particular finding type means and what are the steps you can take to remediate that. Those remediation steps will often then point to the second document, which is the Amazon EKS Security Best Practices. This is an open source document that we have published that is really aligned with just best practices in general for EKS when it comes to security and how you can go about and actually remediate uh, or uh, adjust the configuration of your Kubernetes cluster to align with security best practices. And so some things that you might find uh, that our, our remediation guidance here are making that API uh, endpoint private. So if, if somebody's interacting with your Kubernetes API in the first place, uh, just making it private so that uh, you are limiting who can access that, or if it needs to be public, uh, guiding you through how to actually put in the, the right whitelisting so that only safe addresses are, are accessing that. But it could also be that you're reversing actions that were taken on the cluster, could be guiding you on rotating credentials or, or secrets, uh, for the users that might have been impacted here, could be uh, around uh, guidance around patching or redeploying or, or terminating uh, the resources that have been impacted by this threat actor. So uh, a lot of um, very detailed guidance that we're going to give you here to help you understand how to remediate these. As you go through and understand these and even have to perform some of these remediations yourself, uh, I definitely recommend keeping track of the steps that you took and wherever you can, uh, building out automation. This could be automation to actually perform the entire remediation. Uh, it could also be automation to go in and uh, collect the additional details that you need to be able to give a thumbs up or thumbs down on, on, on performing that particular remediation. The other thing I would actually recommend on as well as you go through these, uh, these remediation steps is identify where you might be able to put some preventative measures in in the future. So if you are having to change the configuration of a, of a particular Kubernetes cluster, that may be something that you actually want all your future clusters to adopt as well. And so pushing that configuration back into the definition uh, of an actual Kubernetes cluster and ensuring that that configuration is followed from the beginning uh, through a deployment uh, and enforcing that through any sort of pipeline or automated checks that you have around the configuration of a cluster before it's deployed can actually help you ensure that you are not uh, dealing with this remediation in the first place because you're enforcing uh, the proper configuration from the very beginning. So let's talk about where you can use uh, the Guard Duty Kubernetes protection feature. So the, the most obvious answer here is your production account and your production workloads. You'd want Guard Duty turned on there, monitoring uh, those resources and, and making sure that your, your production environments uh, are, are protected or that you're aware of threats uh, in your production environment. But there's actually other opportunities here to use guard duty to ensure that you're getting the right level of visibility around Kubernetes clusters that are being deployed throughout all of your environments. And, and it might even actually give you insight uh, or early warning uh, about threats before they ever make their way into production. So first of all, many customers give each of their developers their own sandbox environment, their own AWS account that they can work with and uh, do their development work and get things ready before they ever push things to be deployed uh, into production. And so you could have Guard Duty uh, and the, the Kubernetes protection feature turned on in there uh, and keep an eye on any chaos clusters that your developers might be building out uh, and give you some early 
uh, insight into configurations that they might be trying to use uh, that might be deemed uh, a risk or a threat to uh, later environments. We also have customers who have deployment pipelines that are building container images and are deploying those container images through various environments uh, before they actually make their way into production. So you could have a deployment pipeline that is building a container image, maybe deploying that into a development environment first uh, to get some initial confirmation that the deployment works uh, and that it's good. You could have the guard duty uh, and the Kubernetes protection feature turned on there to start getting some early insight uh, into uh, any threats that may be observed. You can also deploy this into your test environment through your pipeline. Kubernetes protection can be turned on there as well. And then finally, in your production environments where you can also have that feature turned on. And so through every one of these particular deployment stages, you could actually be leveraging guard duty uh, to help you uh, understand any threats that have happened. And also for those non-production environments, uh, it would be an opportunity for you to actually pause uh, a particular deployment if certain threats are being observed so that you can remediate those uh, and apply the appropriate uh, configurations before that ever moves on its way into production. And as uh, I mentioned before, uh, Guard Duty is integrated with AWS organizations. And so you have the ability to have a, a single delegated administrator account that can view all the Guard Duty findings across all of your accounts. And so using Guard Duty across many different environments, you can then actually consolidate all of those findings into one central account. In this case, we have a security account where that security team would have visibility around findings that are happening for all these different environments. Uh, and they'd be in a position to take action or reach out to the appropriate owners for any threats that are being observed. Okay. Let's move into uh, another feature uh, of Guard Duty that was recently announced uh, that has a container aware uh, aspect of it. And this is the, uh, the Guard Duty malware protection feature. So the Guard Duty malware protection feature is a fully managed component uh, of the Guard Duty service. Uh, it is focused on being able to detect malware within your AWS environment. Specifically, it's focused on EC2 workloads uh, and uh, will produce malware specific findings in your guard duty environment. Uh, and this service uses a combination of third party engines, as well as our own uh, threat intelligence and some machine learning to identify uh, malicious content, which could then be uh, uh, a potential threat to your, uh, your environment and the workload that it's running on. So, this feature, it's there to detect malware. There, there's various types of malware that exist out there, whether it be Trojans, worms, bots, crypto miners, et cetera. This is focused on detecting that malware on your file system uh, and presenting that as a new finding in the Guard Duty service. I mentioned before that it focuses on EC2 workloads. Um, this also uh, is applicable to containers that are running on an EC2 instance. And so this feature is container aware uh, and it will be able to provide container specific details for uh, managed features such as the uh, Amazon EKS and Amazon ECS. Or if you're running self-managed containers on an EC2 instance, we can help report on malware for all of those use cases in the, when you have uh, an EBS volume attached to the EC2 instance that is running uh, the container workloads. And then a really key thing here about this particular feature is that it's agentless. You don't have to go in and install any additional security software for this feature to, to start adding value and to first start doing its job. You just enable the malware protection feature. You accept the service link role, which gives a little extra permission to, to certain resources. Uh, and then Guard Duty malware protection takes over uh, and does its work on the side. So no security software, uh, no impact to performance uh, of your EC2 instances. So with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about how this particular feature works uh, so that you understand the interaction between Guard Duty uh, and your EC2 instances. The first thing here is that if you are using uh, KMS encryption to encrypt your EBS volumes at rest, the service link role that you accept for this feature will share, uh, allow the Guard Duty service team account to access a copy uh, of that KMS key so that it can work with your encrypted EBS volumes. Currently, the service only supports EBS volumes that are encrypted with 
a customer master key if you are using the default KMS key uh, for EBS. Uh, Guard Duty uh, malware protection will not be able to support uh, those particular volumes. If you're not using encryption at all on your volumes, the Guard Duty uh, malware protection service will actually temporarily encrypt uh, that data while it's in the Guard Duty service team account. So let's take a scenario where we have a customer running uh, an EC2 instance. They've got a couple of EBS volumes attached to that instance, and then those EBS volumes uh, are encrypted at rest with, with a KMS key. Guard Duty raises a finding. Uh, Guard Duty, uh, this would be an EC2 related finding. Guard Duty will perform its malware detection uh, services based on any EC2 findings that are unlikely related to malicious activity or, or malware find files that might exist on your our infrastructure. And so there's currently 29 different uh, guard duty finding types that would trigger uh, a malware scan, things like Bitcoin mining, things like communication with a, a command and control server, uh, things like your EC2 instances now port scanning uh, other infrastructure. Those types of findings would actually trigger uh, a malware scan to happen. So in, in this case, we have a, a guard duty finding that's been generated against your EC2 instance. What's going to happen here is, is using the permissions from that service link role, uh, guard duty is going to create a snapshot uh, for each of the EBS volumes that are tied to your EC2 instance, and then is going to share that snapshot with the guard duty service team account. Guard duty uh, will then launch in its own account a new compute resource and attach uh, EBS volumes to that instance that are based uh, on a snapshot that was shared with the service team account. This will do its work to then scan uh, the EBS volumes for uh, malware files using the, the techniques I talked about in the earlier slide. If any malware is detected, that will be produced in and sent into Guard Duty as a brand new finding type. Guard Duty will then delete that snapshot from your, uh, from your account we will then terminate uh, the compute resources and the EBS volumes in, in the Guard Duty Service Team account that were used to uh, perform uh, that malware scan. So let's talk a little bit about what are some of the, the key pieces of information you would get uh, from this and how does that relate to containers? And so on the left here, I have a finding type uh, on a, from EC2 related that is indicating that uh, Bitcoin mining uh, is being observed uh, on a particular EC2 instance. Uh, and then I have on the right a finding for uh, a detected malicious file. So the first thing we're going to get here is in the bottom right here is that threats detected area that's going to highlight this is the name of the malware file I found, and this is the path to that particular malware file. We're also going to correlate to you the particular resource it was on. In this case, it's the EC2 instance. So you can see on the left-hand side, I have a, a Bitcoin mining observed on an EC2 instance, and on the right-hand side, I actually have a malicious file that's been observed for a particular uh, EC2 instance, and these are the same EC2 instance. So it's giving you uh, the ability to have a stronger signal uh, that you have uh, multiple things going on with a particular EC2 instance that might warrant uh, more of your time or attention to, to be able to investigate and, and remediate that particular threat. We're also gonna give you uh, more information to actually correlate those, those findings uh, in a different way. So uh, each finding that is generated by Guard Duty has a unique finding ID. We will also, in the malware-related findings, give you the trigger finding ID. So if you are ever looking at a malware-related finding in Guard Duty, you wanna know exactly which finding originally triggered this malware scan, you could use that trigger finding ID from the malware scan details to, to get to that. Whether you uh, search through your findings based on that finding ID or just clicking on that plus symbol uh, next to the trigger finding ID would automatically populate the, the guard duty filter uh, and bring up the other findings that are related uh, to this particular uh, malware finding. And then I mentioned earlier that uh, the malware protection feature is container aware. So whether you're using ECS, EKS or, or running your own customer managed uh, container workloads on EC2 will provide you additional detail about that particular resource and, and the containers that are impacted. So in this example here, I have an ECS cluster where we're also being able to give you the details about the actual cluster and the task and the actual containers uh, within that task where we actually observed uh, the malware 
that is uh, on your EC2 instance. So this gives you the ability to go and get exactly to the source uh, of that malware and uh, identify uh, exactly where you're going to be able to take action, uh, both for remediating the initial threat, but also uh, potentially some preventative controls uh, around uh, addressing how that, uh, that malware got into the container in the first place. Okay, next let's talk about Amazon Inspector and some of the key features that Inspector has uh, that enable you to actually uh, apply security uh, and get security insight for your containers. So we relaunched uh, the Amazon Inspector service uh, in November of 2021 at the uh, AWS reInvent conference. Uh, and Inspector is focused on giving you continuous vulnerability assessments against the workloads that it supports. It's a one-click enablement. You go in, click one button, and you turn the Inspector service on or, or make one API call. Uh, Inspector is integrated with AWS organizations, so you can have full visibility uh, from one account uh, for vulnerabilities that exist in all your other accounts of an organization. Uh, and then Inspector is continuously scanning workloads. And, and so today, Inspector supports uh, vulnerability scanning for EC2 instances and container images that are stored in Amazon ECR. And so uh, Inspector is continuously scanning these resources and anytime a new vulnerability is identified, uh, we'll provide those findings uh, in the uh, Inspector console as well as those findings can be sent to Amazon Secure, EWS Security Hub uh, or Amazon Event Bridge. And we give you context uh, around that particular vulnerability, not only what was the vulnerability observed, but uh, which uh, particular resource it is, and, and we'll get into it in a minute, but we'll give you a lot more detail about where in that container image we actually identified uh, that particular vulnerability so that you can go in uh, and have a very fine-grained uh, view and, and ultimately figure out what's your, your right path to remediating that vulnerability. So specific to container images, let's talk about what Inspector is actually doing to be able to, to scan these images and, and, and detect, detect and identify uh, vulnerabilities in those images. So the first thing that's going to happen is after you've, you've pushed an image into uh, Amazon ECR, which is the uh, Elastic Container Repository, Inspector is going to go in and pull a copy of that image from ECR so they can do its scan. It's then going to take an extract and, and pull apart each layer uh, of that image, and it's going to look at each image on its own. We're going to look at the operating system that, that is actually installed uh, for that particular uh, container image, as well as all the installed packages that are that are part of the the normal package manager of that particular operating system. But Inspector is actually going to go beyond that. Uh, Inspector will actually look through the rest of the file system uh, of that particular container image, looking for other files that may have vulnerable software uh, in them. And so Inspector has support for 10 different programming languages that allow it to go beyond the, the standard package manager and look deeper uh, into the files of your container image and help you identify where vulnerabilities might be present uh, in other places besides the traditional uh, installation paths. And then we're going to take all of that information that's been extracted and we're going to compare that against our vulnerability database to produce uh, the ultimate uh, list of findings for a particular container image. Now, there's a couple of key pieces of information I want to highlight here when it comes to configuration uh, for Inspector uh, and its container-focused uh, vulnerability detection. The first one is that you can, uh, for ECR, configure the, con the repositories that you're using for continuous or, or on-push scanning. So on-push means that uh, anytime you push a container image in ECR, Inspector will pull a copy of that and scan it and, and produce any vulnerabilities that were found. But you can also go for continuous. If you'd like to have Inspector, every time its vulnerability uh, database is updated, rescan your container images to see if there's any new vulnerabilities that are, that are uh, you know, now exist in your images, you can choose the continuous option. And uh, we will continue to scan the, your container images uh, until the time frame that you've uh, identified. And you can also, if you don't want to scan all of your repositories or you only want certain repositories scanned on push, you can use the filter option to uh, narrow that down to specific repositories that you care about. 
This is all configured within the Amazon ECR uh, service in the uh, private registry option. We talked about the continuous scanning for your container images. And so you can either choose to have your container images scanned, rescanned for the lifetime that that container image is in ECR, or you could choose to do just for the first 180 days or for the first 30 days that we would continuously scan that. And so there's a lot of flexibility for customers here. Some customers, they're replacing their container images so frequently that they don't want that continuous uh, feature because the container images are already out of date uh, based on uh, how active they are with, with updating their images. Some customers prefer to have that visibility for a much longer period of time. So you have a lot of flexibility here. So key thing to keep in mind is that after you've hit that uh, continuous window, so if you've got the 180 days or, or 30 days uh, option configured, what's going to happen is uh, in Inspector, we're going to change that image status to inactive uh, and we'll indicate that it's expired, giving you very clear insight that we are no longer scanning that particular container image. Inspector is also going to close the findings for that particular container image. You'll still be able to find them in the Inspector Console, but they'll have a status of closed. And then after 30 days, uh, those closed findings are actually deleted entirely uh, from the, uh, the Inspector service, and they're lo no longer visible to you in the console. So when you go into the Inspector Console, there's a couple of key pieces of information that we are going to surface in the actual dashboard. Uh, of Inspector that are going to help you prioritize and get the right insight uh, for your containers. So the first one is we're going to give you a list of all the repositories that have most critical findings. So this allows you to identify where you could have a significant impact or, or where uh, you may want to start uh, your vulnerability management journey for your containers. We're also going to give you information on the actual container images uh, that have the most critical findings. And so this will also allow you to go out and figure out where you want to start uh, your vulnerability management uh, and which areas you're going to uh, address first and where you might have the most impact to, to reduce uh, your risk when it comes to vulnerabilities. Digging a little bit deeper, we actually produce findings for each container image uh, that has vulnerabilities. And so this view here is for one particular container image, giving me insight into uh, the critical high and medium findings uh, that were, uh, were found for this particular image. And so the view I have here is the by finding tab, which is just listing every single vulnerability that was identified for this particular container image. But I can also choose a different view and that's the by layer tab. So if I wanna see how things are, are actually impacted within the layers, uh, of my particular container image. I can choose by layer. It will show each layer and a summary uh, of the findings that were observed for each layer. And then I can actually expand each layer uh, and go out and find and see the exact uh, vulnerabilities and which packages are impacted uh, at that particular layer. So this can really give you insight into where you're going to exactly go out and, and patch and remediate your container images uh, for the vulnerabilities that you want to ultimately address or which are the most impactful to your organization. So when it comes to remediating uh, container findings that are, are identified by inspector, there's a couple of steps you can take. First one is just deleting the image from Amazon ECR will immediately close all the associated findings that exist in inspector and they'll be removed from the active findings view. And then you go out and you do the work and you, you patch that particular container image and then you publish uh, a new version of that. Uh, that will be treated as a brand new container image in ECR and Inspector would repull that image and rescan it uh, and produce uh, new updates, uh, either reporting back uh, new vulnerabilities or what the current vulnerability state is or uh, reporting no vulnerabilities uh, if you've completely patched uh, and addressed every single uh, item in that particular image. So our customers uh, often have uh, automated processes in place or want to be able to interact with the uh, vulnerability uh, management aspect for their containers and be able to use that to influence uh, if containers are actually deployed uh, into production environments or to be able to react quickly uh, when a container image is identified as having vulnerabilities. And so I wanna highlight 
what's the workflow uh, a little bit more between uh, ECR and inspector and then show you how you might incorporate this into uh, a, a deployment, a build and deploy pipeline. So to start off with, let's, uh, let's imagine we have an ECR, uh, an image that's being pushed into ECR. The ECR service is going to receive that image. It's going to send a notification out via Amazon Event Bridge that's going to go to the inspector service. Inspector is going to receive that event, that, uh, that a new container image that's been pushed into ECR. It's going to scan that uh, image using the, the techniques we talked about earlier and produce a final report. Uh, and this is going to be the scan status event. And that's going to be sent out to Amazon EventBridge. And then that scan status event, you could build rules uh, in EventBridge, which are looking for certain patterns and, and route that on to a particular target uh, if that uh, particular pattern is matched. So a key thing to keep in mind here is that all of these pieces up to the scan status event being sent to Amazon EventBridge are managed by AWS. As soon as you turn on the inspector service, all of this configuration is put into place uh, and takes place automatically. You just have to focus on putting the rule uh, in place in Amazon EventBridge uh, and routing that to a particular target. So here's an example of that scan status uh, event that's that's being produced by inspector and sent to uh, EventBridge. And so there's a couple of key pieces of information here. You can see the scan status itself, which is indicating that the uh, initial scan of the container image is complete. And then also you have a summary uh, of the finding severity counts that were found in that particular container image. This message would also contain the actual repository that the image is located in, as well as the uh, unique identifier uh, of that particular image. So this is all really important to, to, to know and, and understand because the scanning that inspector does for a container image is asynchronous from the actual push of an image to ECR. You can't push an image to ECR and immediately call inspector to say, what are the vulnerabilities? There's a, a period of time that you have to wait for an inspector to actually pull the image and do the scanning. And, and inspector tries to get that done uh, in just a few minutes, but you do need to give it a, a, a little bit of time to be able to, to produce that final vulnerability summary uh, to use to actually trigger the next events that you might take uh, for a particular container image. So let's take an example here of a deployment pipeline. Uh, and so in this case, I have it uh, configured with uh, AWS code pipeline. Uh, it's got a source uh, based on a code commit repository. It's got a build stage using AWS code build. We've got an approval step that is focused on uh, assessing if the uh, container uh, has vulnerabilities and if uh, what the thresholds, uh, how that looks versus thresholds that we define for vulnerabilities, and then ultimately deploying the container image uh, in the ECS uh, if the, no thresholds have been breached when it comes to vulnerabilities. So we have a situation here where a customer uh, has users that are making Git pushes. In this case, we're using AWS code commit. Code commit sends a, a notification to EventBridge that there are new pushes that have been made to that particular repository. The EventBridge uh, is configured to uh, have a, a target uh, of our code pipeline. And so when uh, new pushes are made to code commit, that will trigger the, the code pipeline uh, and the source stage will actually reach out into the repository uh, and pull out the necessary uh, files that are needed uh, to perform the rest of the steps uh, of the pipeline. In this case, it's going to pull the, the build spec uh, YAML file that's going to tell the code build service which commands to run, uh, as well as the actual Docker file that will have all the instructions on how to build uh, the Docker image. And so the AWS build, the build stage of code pipeline will then build that particular container image based on the instructions retrieved from the code commit repo. And it will then push that image uh, into Amazon ECR. Once the build's done, it will then kick off the, uh, the approval stage, uh, this approval stage will send out a message via Amazon SNS containing uh, some key information around the actual code pipeline itself, the uh, unique uh, token that is associated with this uh, approval stage. And that token will have to be sent back uh, when setting an approve or deny, uh, as well as the uh, SHA uh, image ID uh, of a particular image that was just built by the code build stage. So you can use a, a Lambda function attached to that SNS topic that will consume uh, all of that information about the, uh, the, the container stage and the, uh, the container image, the pipeline stage and the overall pipeline, 
and store those uh, in a DynamoDB table. Additionally, now that we have that container image pushed to Amazon ECR, we have Inspector doing all its goodness around being able to scan that particular container image and report back on vulnerabilities. We use that scan complete message that I had talked about earlier as a trigger uh, in Amazon Event Bridge to then call, in this case, a Lambda function. The Lambda function is going to read that scan status message, look at the summary information provided, and compare the summary of each of the, the, the high, critical, or medium items against a threshold that is defined as an environment variable in the Lambda function. And if any of those thresholds are, are breached as far as how many findings of a particular type or severity uh, exist, that container image would then be uh, rejected. Uh, or if no uh, thresholds are, are exceeded, uh, then that container image would be approved. And, and so in either case, this Lambda function would pull the, the key details about that particular pipeline from that DynamoDB table that we populated earlier, and then send the approved or reject message uh, along with the, uh, the information about the stage back to the code pipeline service. And if an approved message was sent the deploy stage would be uh, initiated and that container image would actually then be deployed uh, into uh, an Amazon ECS cluster. If uh, the uh, container image was rejected, that would all be, uh, the pipeline uh, would be uh, stopped uh, and have a, a uh, completed uh, in error status. So this is all actually uh, related to a blog post that will be coming up here in the near future that will dive deep into how to use Inspector uh, for this particular scenario, it will have uh, CloudFormation templates uh, as well as code samples that you can use to actually uh, simulate this uh, in your own environment uh, and get a better sense of how you could use Inspector for uh, your particular uh, processes around how you uh, deploy and manage containers in, in your environment. So keep an eye on the AWS security blog uh, for this in the near future. Okay, so the last service uh, I want to talk about is Amazon Detective and its support for Amazon EKS. And so Detective is a uh, threat hunting and investigation service uh, in AWS. Uh, it's uh, built to collect data from various AWS log sources. And so today that is Amazon Guard Duty, uh, Amazon CloudTrail, uh, PPC flow logs, and now EKS audit logs. Just like guard duty, detective is automatically consuming uh, all of this information. As soon as you turn on the detective service, you don't need to configure uh, any of these log sources or, or turn them on. Detective will automatically consume them for you. Uh, once again, if you do wanna have the data available to yourself, you would need to turn on those log sources and configure uh, where the, the data should be stored. So detective is going to cons consume all of this information. It is going to perform some automated anal analysis by taking that information and putting it into a, a graph database and establishing relationships around uh, which types of resources uh, are, are part of any one particular log file or, or guard duty finding, uh, and what are the relationships uh, to other resources from the same log file or, or other log files. And then ultimately, uh, Detective is going to give you the ability to get more visual insights uh, into the data that it's collected and, and allows you to start an investigation from a guard duty finding or from scratch uh, based on uh, particular uh, areas that you're trying to look into, whether it be IAM roles, IP addresses, EC2 instances, et cetera, uh, allowing you to identify what's the root cause uh, and if you actually have a security incident uh, or issue going on so that you can identify a, a response and a remediation uh, approach. So specific to Detective for EKS, we talked about it's ingesting the EKS audit logs. It's going to give you a view of what are your EKS clusters and what are all the interactions that have been happening with that cluster over time. And, and Detective maintains uh, a year's worth uh, of log data. So once you turn on this feature, Detective will start consuming those EKS audit logs and over time get you up to a 12 month window where you'll be able to see what is the activity and identify where are some abnormal uh, activities that might be happening uh, from that time series. Guard duty is a key source uh, of investigations uh, for Amazon Detective. So you could take a guard duty Kubernetes related finding and begin your investigation and detective from there or, or start your own search if you're trying to just identify 
more about what's going on with a particular cluster or a pod uh, within your Kubernetes environment. Uh, we mentioned it's helping you get to the root cause of those issues. And this feature is gonna give you two new tabs when you're doing an investigation. One is giving the actual Kubernetes activity. Uh, and the other one is actually allowing you to investigate what are the actual Kubernetes API calls that were made by uh, a particular resource or, or, or towards a particular resource so you can get a better sense of what may have happened or is happening uh, against your Kubernetes cluster. So I've got some screenshots here to help articulate so this feature and what are some of the key pieces of information you can get at uh, when investigating uh, your EKS clusters. And so this first screenshot is really the, the search screen uh, of Detective. And so we're highlighting, uh, in this case, we're looking for guard duty findings. Uh, and we've got two findings here that are specific to Kubernetes workloads coming from guard duty. And I can actually see uh, I've got some successful anonymous access uh, against one of my clusters here. That, that may be a key area that I actually want to investigate further. Clicking on and choosing any one of those findings from a guard duty perspective will actually give me all of the entities that are related to that particular finding. And that goes back to the, the, the uh, taking those that log or finding information and putting it into a graph uh, database so that we know all, what are all the different areas that are related to that particular finding. In this case, I'm highlighting that I can actually see the actual EKS cluster that that finding was for, uh, as well as the specific Kubernetes user uh, that is uh, a part of or, or, or impacted by that particular finding. Clicking on see profile will take me to the detail page for that particular entity uh, in the detective console. So in this case, I've chosen the actual EKS cluster. And so this is gonna give me more details about the actual uh, cluster in my environment as far as where it's deployed, which network it's in, which account it's in. will also give me details about all the containers that were running on that cluster during the time period. So in the upper right, you can see I've got a particular time scope that I'm operating against for this investigation. I can see all the different containers that were running at that particular time. Uh, what was the specific image? I can go to the, click on and go to the profile of that particular image. And if, if I launch that container image with any sort of security context, uh, I can also view the details uh, of that as well here. If I'm looking at a particular pod or investigating that, I can actually do a, uh, a filter to actually tell me what were all the container images that were associated with a particular pod, whether it be from a registry uh, or a workload or, or a repository. So allowing me to, to get more uh, insight uh, into a particular pod and, and all the containers associated with that. If I am looking at a particular user, so in this case, I'm, I'm going back to that anonymous user that we saw earlier. Uh, this is an example of the Kubernetes API call tab that I highlighted earlier. Uh, when I'm looking at that particular user, I can actually say, what were all the Kubernetes API calls this particular user made? show me the various patch lists, create gets that they may have executed. And then I can actually expand those. In this case, I'm expanding the create option. And I can, I can actually see that this particular user created a cron job and that they were successful uh, in doing that. And that may be my indicator or that may be the thing that tells me, okay, I've got something that I need to investigate deeper because I now can see that somebody anonymously has, has done this and I can see specifically what they've done uh, against my Kubernetes cluster. I can also investigate by a particular IP address. So if I'm investigating a suspicious IP address uh, that maybe uh, my security team uh, has brought to my attention, I could put that IP address into Detective and, and go search on that. And actually, once again, go and see what are the specific API calls that that IP address made uh, and what were the various AP, uh, API actions uh, that that uh, IP address took, which might help me better understand what are they trying to do or what have they done uh, against a particular clust cluster or against uh, Kubernetes environments uh, as a whole. Uh, I can also use that IP address feature to actually use the Kubernetes activity tab to actually tell me which pods well, were running uh, against this particular uh, IP address or, or with this particular IP address and which AWS accounts uh, were they deployed in. I can also, if I'm doing an investigation about a particular EC2 instance, I can actually use that instance ID as a resource in Detective and use that Kubernetes activity 
uh, tab once again to be able to see for the CC2 instance, for the time frame that I'm investigating, what were the particular pods that were deployed onto that particular instance, which accounts were they in, so that I can dig deeper into the actual containers that might be on those pods uh, or understand uh, where I may have uh, impact uh, against or coming from uh, a particular resource on that EC2 instance. Okay, so the last thing I'd like to leave you with are, are a couple of resources that you can use to learn a little bit more about some of the items that I talked about today. The first one is a blog uh, that's published specific to the Amazon Guard Duty EKS uh, Kubernetes protection feature. So this is a deeper dive blog into how to actually use some of the findings to uh, arrive uh, at uh, a, you know an identification of what's happening against your environment and how to remediate that. Uh, and then for the guard duty malware protection feature, we uh, recently launched that at AWS Reinforce. Uh, there's a YouTube recording that introduces uh, that new feature and talks more about how that works uh, and how you might use it uh, for both your EC2 and your container-based workloads. Okay, with that, I'd like to start off by thanking you for your time. Uh, I really appreciate uh, you taking time out of your day to actually come and learn more about this. I hope this was very helpful to you. Uh, and I look forward to talking more with you uh, about uh, these features and services in the future. Thank you.